been in this study now. Of course, we've been in our prophecy study since the end of January. But specifically, these uh, parallel prophetic passages, we've been in these now. This is our fourth week, and this will be the last week of this particular topic. But there's so much to digest in these four passages that I, I felt like if I just went through it one week, it would be awful hard to digest it. And two weeks, three weeks, so this is our fourth week. We're looking at each individual chapter, and really we're going back to every chapter to see how these tie together. And I want us to understand uh, that these passages are not disjointed. They are talking about the same events. Uh, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, uh, Revelation chapter 13, and Revelation chapter 17. And uh, so I want us to see that again tonight. At the end of this, at least in this little part of our prophecy study, I want us to have a thorough understanding of what these uh, these dreams are about, what this prophecy is about. Uh, this isn't that difficult to understand. Now, no doubt there are parts that uh, take a little extra study and looking into, uh, but I think it's very easy. We'll just focus on what God's Word says to really understand what is being taught here. And just a reminder that when God gave this uh, these dreams to Nebuchadnezzar, this dream to Daniel, this, for the most part, was all prophecy. Uh, but now, much of it is history. Now we can look back and see how that many of these things have already been fulfilled. Yet there are still some parts that are prophecy. They have yet to be fulfilled. But mark it down, they will be fulfilled. Just like the parts from the past were fulfilled, these parts will be fulfilled as well. Uh, in, the, in the last days, there will come scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? There's going to be scoffers like that. Uh, there's going to be apostasy. There are going to be false churches, uh, preachers who are teaching work salvation and, and other religion. Uh, but Jesus said all those things would happen. But that does not change the truth that these things are coming. These things are going to happen. And that's what I want us to see again clearly tonight. So we're going to go back through some familiar territory. If you've been here the last three weeks, then you, we've read many of these passages. But I want us to go through briefly and touch each of them again. Uh, just so we thoroughly understand this. In Daniel chapter 2, the story is Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He could not remember the dream. And so he called in his wise men, his astrologers. He said, tell me my dream. And they said, we can't tell you your dream. He said, if you don't tell me my dream, I'm going to kill you. And so Daniel got some prayer partners together. Very important. He got uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He got them together and they prayed. And they said, Lord... Please give us the answer. Well, God did give Daniel the answer. He told Daniel what the dream was, and he told him the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel made sure to point the glory and honor to the Lord and not to himself. If you look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, he said, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, a statue, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, it was shiny, it was bright, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible, meaning it instilled terror. It was frightening. Verse 32, this image of the head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands. Why? Because this is the Lord. Notice, it's a stone cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. and We will tell the interpretation thereof. Before the king. And he goes on to tell Nebuchadnezzar. If you see the end of verse 38. To Nebuchadnezzar he says. Thou art this head of gold. He said you're this head of gold in the dream. Verse 39. After thee. So notice the head of gold has to fall. So that another kingdom can come into place. What's the difference between all these kingdoms. And the kingdom that the Lord sets up. The kingdom the Lord sets up is forever. Even forever and ever. It will never pass away. It's forever. But man these kingdoms of men will pass away. Notice verse 39. He said, After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. That's the breast and arms of silver. That's the Medes and the Persians. And we saw that from Daniel chapter number 5. And then notice after uh, the Medes and the Persians, then there's a third kingdom of brass. We, through Scripture, saw that's 
Alexander the Great and Grecian. Remember, anytime it's talking about these kingdoms, it's talking about not just a kingdom, but a king, somebody who leads that kingdom. And so Nebuchadnezzar is that head of gold, but also so is the Babylonian Empire, both. Uh, the Medes and the Persians. And then you have the, the, the brass, the uh, third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule. And verse, verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. And that was the Roman Empire. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes. Well, what do the feet and toes come off of? The two iron legs. So the feet and toes are a continuation of the two iron legs, which is the Roman Empire, which was split into two, the East and the West of Roman Empire. The feet and the toes come off of those legs. And notice, uh, the Bible says, verse 41, the feet and the toes were part of potter's clay and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes, how many toes are there? There's ten. That's important. As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And then he describes the way this kingdom is going to be in verse 43. He says, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another. That's what we have in the United Nations. We have nations. They're separate entities, yet they come together and make decisions. You have, uh, you have a security council, five nations, all nuclear powers, by the way, that have a veto, uh, that have a, a, a deciding vote in the security council. And then you have ten other nations that cycle through every two years. I believe the structure is in place right now for these things we're reading. Uh, there's going to be not one nation that's going to stand up and rule and reign over the world, but there is going to be a man who will be a satanically possessed man who will lead a group of nations, who will lead the world. As, as the first president of the United Nations say, he said, he said, we're looking for a man who can unite all these nations, and be he God or devil, we'll receive him. And it is going to be devil. He's going to, they're going to receive him. The world's going to receive him. And notice, it says, verse 43, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This is God's prophetic outline. God outlined it for Daniel, and he sent it through a dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Let's pray. Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to understand as we study your word. Help us to understand how this applies to us today. Lord, strengthen our faith. We realize these things that have been prophesied have come true, and yet there's some more to come. Help us to understand and believe your word clearly tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go to Daniel 7. So Nebuchadnezzar had that dream. Then in our second week, we looked at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel now has a dream. He has a vision. And if you'll notice, chapter 7, verse 2, he saw the four winds of the heavens striving. There are strove upon the great sea. Verse 3, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. What you need to remember is that Daniel 7 is simply reiterating what Daniel 2 said. Now, there are a few different uh, 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 details, but for the most part, it's reiterating the same thing that happened in Daniel 2. Notice, there's these four great beasts. The first was like a lion. Well, that's Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth. Uh, verse 5, there was another beast, a second like to a bear. That's the Medes and the per Persians. It's raised up on one side. Why? Because one side is stronger than the other. It had three ribs in its mouth. Verse 6, after this I beheld below another like a leopard. It's extremely fast. It's cunning. And it has four wings of a fowl on its back. And so it's extremely fast. The beast had also four heads. And dominion was given to it. We know that Alexander the Great, when he died, his kingdom was divided between four generals. Again, this is not written after Alexander the Great. This is written before Alexander the Great. These are things that are now history. Uh, look at verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Like the iron legs of the statue, this beast has great iron teeth. Notice it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This beast is the Roman Empire. Notice, coming out of this beast 
are ten horns, just like coming out of the two legs of iron. There's feet with ten toes, part of iron, part of clay. Notice also among those ten horns, there in verse 8, it says, I considered the horns, they came out of uh, that fourth beast, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. This is speaking of the Antichrist. This is speaking of that man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, otherwise known as the beast, also in Revelation. Notice it says, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So you had ten horns, and three of them are plucked up by the roots. Well, the beast removes those three. He, he conquers. Notice, and uh, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. It's very important to understand this because we're going to see heads and horns throughout these, these uh, symbols. Heads represent decision-making, seat, the seat of authority, place to make decisions. Horns, if you find horns in the Bible, it's referring to authority and power. It's usually referring to military power and might. Uh, if here what you have is you have a man who's a little horn who's going to lead. And who is this? This is the Antichrist. Now go to, and we read further in Daniel 7, uh, notice down to verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 13. It says, I saw in, uh, go to verse 11. It says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. And his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Remember, the Antichrist will be cast forever to the lake of fire. The kingdom that he leads will be destroyed. Notice verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And as you read further in Daniel 7, he explains the dream, and it's a mirror image of Daniel 2. It's saying there's kingdoms coming that are going to rule and reign in the world, but one day the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to destroy all of those kingdoms. And he is going to rule and reign. Amen. Now, last week, we looked in Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13, please. Revelation 13. Again, it's very, it's very important for us to understand. These are not disjointed passages of Scripture. These are all related. They all tie together. Look at Revelation 13. Again, just a different way of saying it. Very similar to how we have the four Gospels. Again, there's only one Gospel. Jesus died, was buried, rose again. People witnessed it. But when we're talking about the Gospels, we're talking about four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why did the Lord have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pen these things down? Why would he have four different accounts? To get four different angles of the same event. Uh, just like you have a witness. You don't take just one viewpoint, one angle. You take different viewpoints of the same event. Well, here you have, uh, again, God referring to these same events in Revelation 13. Notice Verse 1, he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now remember in Daniel, the Antichrist was referred to as the little horn. So he has some military power, he has some military uh, decisions he can make, but here you're going to see him represented as one of the heads. Notice in Revelation 13, it says, verse 2, the beast which I saw. Notice this beast is an amalgamation. It's a mix of all those beasts that you saw in Daniel 7. Notice the beast which I saw, he said, was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. What is all this saying? It's all tied together. It's all related. What it's saying is this is going to be a mixture, just like Daniel 2 talked about how they're going to mingle themselves together, but they're not going to cleave one to another. This end times kingdom is going to be led by the man of sin. He's going to lead, and he is going to prosper for a while. He's going to persecute and put God's people through tribulation. But he will be overthrown. He will be cast down. But keep reading. It says, verse 2, The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. Who's the dragon? If you read 
In chapter 12, it's Satan. The dragon gave him his power. If you read later on, who allows the dragon to give him power? God does. God's still in control. Right. He, even when Satan has his day. Remember when Jesus was arrested and going to be crucified? He said, your hours come. What does that mean? It means you go ahead and have your fun now because God's allowed you to have it. But it's going to be over. Yeah. Now, the same is true with these kingdoms of the world. Notice the Bible says his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads. Now, don't miss this because this is so important to understand all of this that's going on. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. Now, he literally was killed and now he's alive again. His deadly wound, it's a deadly wound because right. it killed him. He now is alive. That, that matters. Hold that thought. Notice, he, when they see, the world sees that he's alive, what happens? All the world wondered after the beast. So when they see that he, that this beast, that one of the heads is wounded, remember the beast doesn't just represent a man. It also represents a kingdom. When they say, see that this kingdom has one of the leaders who is wounded to death. Then he's healed. The whole world wonders after him. People say, you know, what is it? What's the strong delusion? People are going to believe a lot. Is it going to be aliens coming and snatching people away? I don't think so. What it's going to be is this man of sin rising from the dead. So where does it say he rises from the dead? We're going, we're going to get to that again tonight. I want us to see that again clearly. Notice verse 4. And they worship the dragon. So they wonder after the beast. And then they worship the dragon, that's Satan, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Folks, if you haven't followed our study, I hope you'll go back and listen to the video. I hope you'll, actually, you'll get into the Bible and see who are saints. Saints are believers. If you're saved, you're a saint. Who are the elect? Those are believers again. If you're, if you're saved, you're the elect. If you're saved, you're the saints. Notice, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Does he have power over believers? He does. Does he have power over unbelievers? He does. He has power over all nations, uh, kindreds, tongues, nations. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There are people who... Foolishly said, well, I just take the mark because I'm going to heaven anyway. Folks, what we need to understand is that when someone takes the mark, it's always associated with worship of the beast. Right. It always is. Look it up in scripture. Every time it's associated with the worship of the beast. Well, compare what this has just said. Go now. Keep your finger in Revelation 13. We're going to flip back and forth a little bit. Go to Revelation 17 now, please. Look at Revelation chapter 17. This, again, is not a disjointed passage. It's referring to similar events. Now, the focus of Revelation 17, the main focus is not the beast. The main focus is the harlot who's riding the beast. And we'll look at that another night. We'll look at who this harlot is, Revelation chapter 17. But we need to understand that this whore, as the Bible says in verse 1, is riding this beast. Is riding this worldwide kingdom is supported by the beast. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes if you ever see uh, prophecy and sometimes you'll see people try to render drawings of what this looks like, you'll see a woman riding the back of this beast. But what this actually says is this woman's riding on the heads of this beast is what it says. Kind of an odd picture. But no, notice what it says, Revelation 17. Again, the focus tonight, we won't focus so much on the whore in Revelation 17, this woman, but we will focus on uh, the beast that she is riding Look at Revelation 17, and notice verse 1. It says, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, 
with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. This is the same beast that's in Revelation 13. Notice. Uh, notice this beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Go back to uh, Revelation 13, and uh, if you look at verse 1, it says he saw the beast, it had seven heads, it had ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. It gives another detail there, and notice, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Is this the same beast? It's absolutely the same beast. It's talking about the exact same thing. It's a kingdom that will be led by the Antichrist, by a political leader uh, that uh, has the seven heads, the ten horns. Notice now, uh, look down in verse, uh, verse number eight. The Bible says, uh, the beast that thou sawest, he, now the angel is going to explain something about this beast. Verse 7, he said, I'm going to show you the mystery of the woman. I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Well, let's break that down. It sounds kind of confusing at first, but just look at it piece by piece. Notice what it says. The beast that thou sawest was, it existed before. The person and the kingdom existed before, the beast that thou sawest was, and is not. When the Bible uses the term is not, it means they're dead. When, uh, when uh, Jacob was describing, was talking about Joseph, he said, I have one, he is not. He meant he's dead. Notice, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, so he existed and then he'll be killed, notice, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So when he's killed, where does he go? He goes to hell. And then notice next, after he ascends out of the bottomless pit, he comes back out of the bottomless pit, and uh, by the way, satanically possessed, notice, and go into perdition. So he's going to be killed. He's going to come out of hell, or he's going to be killed, rather. Verse 8, he was. He is not. He'll be killed. Then he'll come up out of hell. He'll go back into perdition. He'll be cast forever into the lake of fire. Notice. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, remember what that's saying. Go back again to chapter 13. Look again at verse 3. It says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Go again to Revelation 17. Let's read it again. Verse 18, the be or verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. When this man is killed and comes back to life, the whole world is going to say, wow. This is the fellow we're supposed to be following. As we saw when we studied the false prophet, he will also perform, the false prophet will perform signs and wonders, and he will point people to worship the beast and to worship an image of the beast. We must remember, the beast is not God. He can't be everywhere at all times, but they are going to make an image to the beast and demand that that image be worshipped, very similarly to how Nebuchadnezzar had an image of gold and demanded it to be worshipped. Uh, so here you have this beast, the, the, the leader, this political leader, who will be slain. He'll rise again. The whole world is going to wonder after him. Look at verse 9, chapter 17, verse 9. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Remember that because we are going to come back to that on another night. But remember in Daniel where it said that that stone became a mountain? That's very important. That's not by accident that those words are here. Just remember that. Uh, go to verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is
is of the seven. What in the world does that mean? He's the eighth. He's of the seven. Keep reading. And goeth into perdition. What does it mean? Exactly what we've been studying. He, would, he is killed. And he comes back to life. Back into a place of power. And the whole world, because he is alive, will say, we need to follow this man. Remember again what the president of the United Nations, the first president said. He said, we need a man who will unite the whole world. Well, what will unite the whole world? When this man rises from the dead and the whole world says, we need to follow him. Just as this man said, be he God or devil, we'll receive him and he'll be a devil. Now, I want you to see, look at uh, Daniel. Keep your finger here in Revelation 17, please. Go to Daniel 7 again. Look at Daniel 7, verses 24 and 25. Daniel 7, verses 24 and 25. The Bible says that the ten horns out of this kingdom uh, are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. And notice we saw again, it says he's going to change times and laws. They're trying to erase Jesus Christ, B.C., A.D. They want to make it now the common era, before the common era. They, they want Jesus erased from our, our, our consciousness. They're going to change uh, times. Notice they're going to change laws. He's going to change laws. He's going to rule and reign not as false versions of the Bible say he's as the lawless one. No, he's going to use the law as a weapon. He's going to weaponize the law yeah. to pass perverse laws to get his way and his will accomplished. Uh, go back now. Look at uh, Revelation again, chapter 17. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, and the ten horns of this beast. Again, these are, these are the same thing. I encourage you uh, we've been on this four weeks. I encourage you to go get Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17. Sit down and study them again. But look at Revelation 17, look at verse 12. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, notice, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, I understand that sometimes in the Bible when it talks about an hour, it's talking about just a period of time or the beginning of a period of time. But what we need to understand if we further read in Revelation 18 is that Mystery Babylon is destroyed in one hour. Say, what does one hour mean? One hour. Say, how does that make any sense? These kings are going to give their power to the beast. And they're going to destroy Mystery Babylon, the woman, by the way, who's riding Revelation 17, who, who's riding the beast. They're going to destroy her in one hour. How in the world could that happen? Have you ever heard of nuclear warheads? How many thousands of nuclear warheads are in the world? At the last count, I, I should have brought the numbers up here. But it, it's, I think it's 15,000, 17,000. It's somewhere around there. Uh, I actually met a fellow. We were, uh, we were collecting yard sale items. Uh, one one summer for the team uh, the, the team trip and he had two uh, pictures we may even still have them here two pictures and they looked like missiles shooting out of the sky and uh, we may still have them I'm not sure and I asked him I said what are these he said well I worked for and I forget the official name but basically for the, the military with the nuclear missiles he said these are pictures these are just practice rounds is what these are I said, so is it true that we're, you know, we're limiting how many nuclear warheads we have? He said, well, actually what happens is now they put multiple warheads on one missile. And so when that missile is launched, it can actually hit multiple targets with nuclear weapons. Can you imagine if 10 kings, 10 horns with military authority all give their power to the beast? By the way, what you're going to see as we read Revelation 17, the end here, is why do they give him power for war? That's why they give him power. To make war with the harlot, the whore of chapter 17, mystery Babylon of chapter 18, but also to make war with the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what it says, uh, verse 12 again, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, 
which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength. What, what power and strength are they given? You know, are they giving them sword, giving them swords and bows and arrows? No. They're turning over the nuclear football. They're turning over the, the codes for all the missiles. They're turning over all the stuff that they have at their disposal. Notice, for one hour, it only takes one hour. Yeah. Yeah. Only one hour. Uh, go, uh, maybe I'll bring it, uh, when we go into Revelation 18, I will bring up just, it's an amazing thing what one of these weapons that hasn't really been detonated before, what it can do. How many miles it can destroy. And yet there are thousands of these in the world. And all these kings are going to give their power and strength under the beast. And it's going to be enough to destroy Mystery Babylon in one hour. Notice verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Why? Verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. They think they can conquer Jesus Christ. Go read Psalm 2. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He just laughs. He's not worried. We don't need to be worried. We're on the winning, we're on the winning side. Uh, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. There's, we know how it ends. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him. That's you if you're saved. Don't let somebody take that from you. It's there. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Say, so are we the chosen? Yeah, we're the chosen people of God. Are we the elect? Yeah, we're the elect. Are we the saints? Yeah, we're the saints. We're all the above. Verse 15, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Keep your finger here. Look at the next chapter. Well, again, we'll spend more time here one night. We'll look at Revelation 18, verse 8. The Bible speaking of this whore, Mystery Babylon, verse 8, says, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. So I thought it said one hour. Well, just keep reading. One day, death and mourning. And famine, this is all going to happen in one day. The most, pop, the most uh, 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 prosperous place in the world. The most pro prosperous place in the world, according to Revelation 18. In one day, death, mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Go to verse 10. What do the people say? Look, they're standing afar off for the fear of her torment, so they can see her torment afar off. It's lifted up to the heavens, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Look at verse 17. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as traded by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? One hour, these ten kings are going to give their power to the beast. One hour. Now, I want us to go quickly tonight to 2 Thessalonians, and then we'll go to one other place. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I, I just want to put this to bed, so to speak. I know I brought this up previously, but I really want us just to fully understand this. So there's no doubt. We don't need to come back to these passages and doubt over and over again. You, you'll be very confused if you just go read people's books about stuff. You will. I, I have many books. And they're confusing. I've told you about one book that has four or five theories about everything in the Bible. It, it's confusing. But if you'll just look at what the Bible says, it's pretty plain. Now look at 2 Thessalonians 2. And I really want to put to bed, now we've studied this before, but this theory that one day the Holy Spirit is going to be taken out of the world. You know, the fact is, I, I was talking to a preacher. And he said, I just, when I showed him what the scripture says about the difference between tribulation and wrath. There is a difference. Right. Biblically, we've studied that. 
Uh, the church, the Bible says, after the tribulation of those days, we've seen the timing, how the church will face tribulation. Right. You won't find the term seven years tribulation anywhere in the Bible. You won't find it. What you'll find is tribulation is man afflicting other men, and you'll find wrath is God on the offense, God on the attack. And what we see in 2 Thessalonians, I was talking to this preacher, and he said, I just don't see how the Antichrist can come to power unless the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. I said, could I speak to you about that? This was in a phone conversation. I said, could I speak to you about that? I said, the Holy Spirit's never taken out of here. Uh, where do you read the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth? Yeah. That's a question. I just I, I want to ask you that. Where do you read the Holy Spirit's removed from the earth? You won't find it in this book. Right. You won't. Right. You'll find it in a lot of other books. You won't right. find it in this one. You won't. Um, notice Second Thessalonians two. And by the way, we're, we're responsible. Once we understand what the Bible says, we're responsible to tell people the truth of what it really says. We're responsible. Uh, we're responsible to uh, preach it accurately. Notice 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to repeat preach that message, but let's go back. 1 Thessalonians 4, typically known as the what? Typically known as the... Rapture is called the what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, that's what it's called. That's what God called it, okay? Right. Verse 1 says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, Say, well, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ is different. We studied that as well. What's going to happen? The believers are going to be taken out of here, and as soon as they're gone, God's wrath is going to fall. Right. Notice, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let a man deceive you. Find out what the Bible says. Amen. And by the way, if this is true, it'll, it'll pan out. If it's true, right. you'll be able to test it. If it's true, you'll be able to prove it from Scripture. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? That day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that day of Christ, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. What's that falling away? It is apostasy. No, it was not mistranslated. No, it should not say a catching away or a snatching away. It's a falling away. It's apostasy. False doctrine, just like Jesus said would happen in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He talked about a falling away. Notice, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And, here he is, that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. So am I. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. But Jesus told us to watch. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation. Now follow with me. I'm only using Bible here. Okay? I promise you. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to trick you. I'm only going to use the Bible. So follow what I'm saying. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, how is he going to be revealed? Well, Jesus said, when you see him, he'll stand in the temple of God. He'll demand to be worshipped as God. Say, wait a minute. That's just for the Jews. We don't need Matthew 24. We don't need. Well, first of all, every book, bit of the book is for me. It's for you. But notice that man of sin will be revealed. How is he going to be revealed? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. How in the world is a man going to pull that off? How is a man going to be able to stand up in the temple and go, Hey, I'm God. Worship me. And everybody just goes, Wow. Is it by really good card tricks? I mean, you know. <laughs> hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> Is it by making the hanky disappear in, in his hand? Say, you're being silly. I sure am. Because there's no, there's no trick he can do that the whole world's going to go, wow, we need to worship this guy, and we need to follow him, and we need to put him in charge of our nukes, and we need to put him in charge of the whole world. I mean, what could this man possibly do that would get the whole world's attention? I'll tell you what he can do. 
He can be killed and rise from the dead. So what has to happen for him to be revealed? He has to be killed. He has to be taken out of the way. You will find the Holy Spirit taken out of anything. Now, just stay with me. Notice verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. How is a man going to pull that off that you think he's God? By rising from the dead. Showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now there's already many antichrists in the world. First John tells us that. There's already a lot of people who could qualify to be the antichrist. And we could waste hours speculating on who it's going to be. But we'll know, based on what Jesus said... When that person stands up and demands to be worshipped as God. Right. Notice, now he know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. There's already a bunch of antichrists in the world. Verse 7, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Well, who were you just talking about? Can you just all of a sudden plug anybody there? We were just talking about the man of sin. How can you all of a sudden plug somebody else in? How can you all of a sudden say he is the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit wasn't even mentioned. Right. How, how in the world can you say, well, he was, you, know, you, you can pick any name. What I'm saying is you won't find that in the Bible. You may read that in the book. You will read that in some books. But you won't read it in the Bible. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. By the way, it's an interesting thing. When you look at the dragon described in Revelation 12, the dragon looks a whole lot like the beast of Revelation 13. What does that mean? This Antichrist, his kingdom, it's empowered by Satan. It looks a whole lot like Satan. It's deceptive like Satan. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Go with me quickly, please, to Mark 13. Mark 13. Is 2 Thessalonians 2 talking about the Holy Spirit? You, you can't take God. He's everywhere. You can't take God away. You can't remove God. He's everywhere. Whither shall I go from thy presence? Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Whose spirit? God's. God can't be taken out of the way. But even more than that, go to Mark 13. Mark 13 is a parallel passage to Matthew 24. <clears throat> so let's just pretend, just for, for sake of pretending that God's people would never face tribulation, God's people would never face trouble, Matthew 24 is just for physical Jews. Let's just pretend that, oh, that's not true. Why then, in Mark 13, which is a parallel passage to Matthew 24, why does he say in verse 11, when they shall lead you and deliver you up, Take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. If you go read Matthew 24, he's talking about that tribulation time and then the time of great tribulation thereafter. Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Did he say, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee? Why does he say the Holy Ghost is there? Because he's there. What I'm saying is, let's not get confused by books that aren't the Bible. Let's just see what the Bible says. Folks, God's prophetic outline has been here. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17. What did he say? He said there's going to be some worldwide kingdoms. There's going to be an end times worldwide kingdom. There'll be ten kings. They'll give their power to the beast. One hour, but guess what? Jesus conquers them all. Amen. 
Jesus destroys them all. We'll rule and reign with him. That, that's the sum of it. That's the sum of it. It's been here since Daniel was bent down. It's been, it's been settled since the beginning. It's true. Every word. Look how our Hi, everybody. This is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect. We are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.